Hello, Alan. Um, super excited to have you here to talk about the core protocol. Um, for anyone who is unfamiliar, Alan is one of the co-founders of Quai Network and is the CEO of Dominant Strategies, which is the development company behind Quai Network. Um, so I'm super excited to have you here to kind of dig into the core protocol and talk about all the stuff that's been going on with the network over the past couple of weeks. So to start off, just from a, a broad perspective, how would you say the core implementation has gone over the past month or so? It's been a change up in pace. So I think we were moving very quickly during some of the prior test nets, and we were really excited to get the Iron Age test net out. And as we've kind of iterated and gotten further in the protocol, we've realized there's a lot of key pieces that just need to be completed to make sure Iron Age goes successfully. We've talked a bit about this on a couple of the community calls and, and Twitter spaces, but I think really looking at the code and taking this time to show people just what we've done and, and what exactly that translates into is really crucial. So as you can kind of see on the screen, we have the repository. It shows some of the high level activity. Primarily a lot of the activity has been around the Go Quai, the manager and the miner. So how exactly those two key pieces interface with each other and just a lot of the underlying consensus mechanisms and glad to dive into that now and yeah. kind of elaborate on some of the process. Let's do it. So I think a great place to start would be core because I know that that and consensus has really been a big focus for y'all um, since the Bronze Age. Some people here might not be familiar with the longest chain rule in proof of work. Can yeah. you kind of give like a brief overview of what the longest chain rule is? Yeah, so longest chain rule is an extension of kind of Satoshi, it's Nakamoto. Satoshi's form of consensus, Nakamoto consensus, and it stems from Bitcoin just saying, as proof of work is being completed, the chain with the most amount of work done on it, i.e. the highest difficulty achieved over a certain set of blocks, will be the chain that is canonical. Mm -hmm. And so taking the idea of what is canonical and sort of abstracting that to coin network has been a lot of the key focus. As we implement hierarchical longest chain rule, that the idea of canonicalization may be sort of different in different contexts. And so contexts being different chains point of view, right? So mm -hmm. if there is, say, a fork in one of the dominant chains, meaning, say, there's an uncle block in prime, that might affect subordinate chains being regions or zones. And so dictating some of that consensus and implementing a hierarchical longest chain rule has sort of been the different avenues that we've taken. And we've had a working implementation of that in the past, but we've refactored a lot of that and mm -hmm. really hardened it as we've seen sort of the security requirements and the guarantees and assurances that we want for the core protocol. So ideally taking a lot of that main hierarchical longest chain rules and really just kind of figuring that out, cleaning it up. Back to the Nakamoto consensus, that process doesn't really work in Quai. Mm -hmm. So there is sort of any idea of like a pre-existing consensus mechanism has just kind of been blown out the window. So the past few months have definitely been restructuring a lot of that, putting in the right pieces to achieve what we want to and ensuring it's done in the right way. So when looking at the longest chain rule, it, it tends to be a very simple rule for, for monolithic blockchains. Like you said, it's really just which, yep. which you know, chain has the, the heaviest amount of work. Um, so with Quai Network's kind of modular implementation of many different chains, what rules have to change or be implemented into the hierarchical longest chain rule to kind of allow it to still function? Yeah, so great question. If you look at how the blockchains interact and how a miner mines them, mm -hmm. so taking that idea of I have a set of a monolithic chain, I have a hierarchy of chains, many different blockchains, and using the idea of merged mining to mine them. So instead of mining on one chain, I use my hash rate across all of them equally. Mm -hmm. I can equally secure all of those blockchains that are in that hierarchy, and I'm securing kind of multiple longest chain rules, right, at, at once, but you have to break that idea down because mm -hmm. it's no longer a single chain. As you said, it's modular, and so, if we, at a fundamental level, have to understand different blockchains and have to take that sort of atomicity of merged mining, mm -hmm. we have to have a way of processing that and understanding that in a very verified way. And so for us to have those connections before, whenever we ran prior test nets, it was all kind of kludged together. And so we had a lot of dependencies on potentially running everything on one computer or having to run exactly a slice, or we couldn't really do our light client implementation as well as we wanted to, or we couldn't roadmap various pieces that could be sort of bucketed out and then revamped because we had certain dependencies on things that were architected a very specific way beforehand. And so at a technical level, by taking the time that we did to sort of blow it up and mm -hmm. then rebuild it, 
It's given us more flexibility around the future. It's given better assurances around what we're doing. And it actually translates better directly to a lot of our white papers and research that we did sort of back at UT and, and up until the fundamental belief of you know HLCR and getting that done. And so seeing that kind of translate one for one mm -hmm. for what's in an academic verified paper to what's in the code is actually really cool. And, and it makes us feel a lot better about it. It makes the implementation feel less kludgy. It feels a lot more just kind of clean and robust. And we've also spent a ton of time just deleting code. So like definitely want to be very open about the fact that we started with Go Ethereum, as a lot of blockchains do. Yep. It's a great starting point, especially for the ones that want to be EVM compatible. I won't attest to like the implementation, implementation, but obviously it's something that we can start with and, and run with. And ultimately very thankful for a lot of the code they've written, and I'm sure a lot of the community is as well. But at this point, I really wouldn't even consider ourselves an Ethereum fork because we've changed so much. And really the only thing we rely on now is the EVM. Like we've stripped out right. all the consensus. We've stripped out a lot of the account logic. We've changed a lot of the hash functions. We're modifying the tree. We're modifying a lot of the syncing and the peering logic so that we're transmitting different data packets and handling them in different ways. So at this point, like, yes, we might've started with that, but there's a logical progression in which we've translated to something completely different today, like even before we get to mainnet. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of a lot of the, the core pieces from a, from a high standpoint, you know, really just making sure there's confidence around a lot of what we're doing. Yeah, and and to kind of build off of, you, you mentioned you've removed a lot of the code. I've had yeah. the privilege of seeing, you know, one PR uh, that removed a massive amount of code. I would love if we could kind of just pull that up real quick and, and take a look. Um, yeah, let me see if I could find it. So it's not directly cut into main, mm -hmm. but I believe this is the one here yeah, where you can see Pretty much just 400,000 lines of code out the window. And so when I first saw this this number, the first thing that jumped into my head was like, w like where are all these lines coming from and how can you just remove so much stuff with right. and, and have it still work? So what are these lines that, that y'all actually removed here? Like, Well, so there's, as we've seen with Ethereum, and this was a lot of kind of Quai's ethos, is a lot of these blockchains, you create them and then they run for a really long time and then you can't change them in flight and it's really hard. Mm -hmm. And that's especially one of the more successful things we've seen with the Ethereum merge and everyone loves talking about it and that's a topic for another time. But I will say kudos, it is hard to change these systems in flight once they're created. And that's why we have to be really careful pre-mainnet because we have a lot of flexibility to change things and, and architect the future mm -hmm. and say if we have to change a certain header value or if we have to change a certain way that the gas is handled or we have to change a certain way that the blockchain has to fundamentally work without a hard fork, we can do that early on. Deleting all of the lines and getting out all the stuff gives us a better purview into what we have to manage. I can say there's 180,000 lines in the code. I get to have to, I have to manage 20,000 of that. Right. You know, someone else on the team has to manage 20,000 of that. And you have your idea of like what's gonna break and you can task stuff and assign stuff. So while we're on that topic, actually, I'm sure it's actually good to jump to like essentially some other Twitter threads that I saw, especially in relation to Geth, as I talked about earlier, that's kind of where we started from is you know, Geth needs to adapt and like these clients need to adapt and being flexible to a lot of the changes is hard whenever you have such a large code base and you don't know what downstream dependencies are going to change. Mm -hmm. So you kind of see here one tweet calling out, you know, directly against some of the other Ethereum clients yep. that kind of spurred a lot of our in inspiration. You know, there's other clients that are leveraging Geth as well in the Ethereum ecosystem, but moving quicker than Geth. And, and Geth might struggle a bit just because it is so large and mm -hmm. you know there's other ways of you know creating from the ground up a better way of achieving the same result so that kind of ties back into this pr and saying well we kind of had to get down to the bare minimum to yep. build it back up in the right way so that was kind of the start of of that endeavor nice so so you think that Kwai is at a good point now where all of the i guess the name of the pr kind of stands <laughs> signs for itself but that the fat has been trimmed that, that y'all are you know slimmed out and ready to 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 build out i guess that is correct and it gives us more, as I said, confidence mm. and ability to put a roadmap in place that we feel that is, is very achievable. And so taking those next steps into essentially rebuilding and getting Kwai to mainnet and to the next testnet and, and so on and so forth. Awesome. Yeah, the, the last thing I'd love to kind of pick your brain about is uh, I know that kind of the focus in the past developer update, we talked about how the focus has kind of transitioned from consensus into more uh, cross-chain transactions sure. uh, and ETXs, all that kind of good stuff. Um, I think a great place to start would really be, you know, what 
is a cross-chain transaction in Quai? What is an ETX? And like, why do things need to change so severely in Quai to be able to support that? Yeah, so a cross-chain transaction in an ETX is essentially the same thing. It's an external transaction that's moving state from one chain to another. And so if you look at the fundamental ethos of Quai Network is we want to be as decentralized as possible and have ways of communicating through these decentralized channels in secure ways. And with the sharded blockchain, you have to have a mechanism of going from one blockchain to another. Mm -hmm. So transferring state from, let's say, Cypress 1 to Cypress 2. And there has to be a very proven and atomic way of doing that. We achieve that with coincident blocks. So coincident blocks are the idea of a merged mind block. So say in Cypress 1, you achieve sufficient level of difficulty for it to be both a Cypress 1 block, but also a Cypress block region. So mm -hmm. it kind of goes from the zone chain here to greater scope here to right. region. And the next way that it can kind of get down is for the same incidents or coincidence to be achieved in Cypress 2, the destination. And so we have this kind of zone transaction, zone to zone transaction existing in Cypress. Mm -hmm. And then once that Cypress 2 region block is achieved, then it can go down. So it has to go kind of up over and then back down right. to be a cross chain transaction. And we can achieve that kind of through that proof of work, because as we talked about canonicalization earlier, a lot of the atomicity and security is actually coming in place with the hierarchical longest chain rule. Because say in the region, there was a rollback or a reorg or an uncle that kind of broke that atomicity. Mm -hmm. That lower chain or that Cypress 2 would also not be canonical anymore. So in practice, you would kind of see that transaction be unapplied because it's not considered canonical. And we see this normally with uncle blocks in Ethereum or other blockchains as they exist today, but they don't have that property of having decentralized bridges that have atomicity through them. And so a cross-chain transaction is sort of a manifestation of HLCR and how state can be transferred between blockchains. Right, yeah. So I, I think a really good point to kind of go deeper on would be like bridges and, and kind of going cross-chain in crypto right now has almost become a dirty word just because of, you know, all the I shudder at the thought. And I know it, yeah, it, it's terrifying. So, yeah. you know, what really differentiates Kwai from all these other bridges and kind of cross-chain ecosystems and opportunities that are being presented to the world? So we know the future is multi-chain, mm -hmm. and that thesis I feel has been generally proven. The security in which the multi-chain future exists in now, or will be, is relatively uncertain. And so we've seen endless hacks. I think it's like. At this rate, four hundred million dollars like every month, yeah. it's like out the window. Like for Quai, being multi-chain inherently as a modular protocol, we need that feature to be as robust as possible, because that is one of the kind of key things. Is if we need to get more chains and we need more block space, then and you want more inherent layer one block space, which is kind of different from like L two block space and other things that rely on kind of those sorts of optimistic proof bridges and other things, which we also have seen are not the most robust things either in certain cases, then these decentralized bridges essentially need to encompass just the core security, right? Mm -hmm. And that's like the whole point of using it in a layer one, because as I said, for the layer two, if you say, okay, we're going to go use Arbitrum and Optimism and all of that, well, then you're subject to the security of the layer two or the censorship resistance of the layer two as opposed to interacting on layer one. And right. so a lot of the benefit here is you're always going to be using layer one with these bridges and we can expand out horizontally as much as we need to mm. while inheriting that same base layer security. Nice. Yeah, so I guess I have one final question on the cross-chain transactions is um, what exactly is the EVM doing in Quai Network to facilitate these transactions? Sure. So essentially we had to modify the EVM sum in order to spit out what looks like a receipt Mm -hmm. as a cross-chain transaction. So if you make a transaction to a certain contract or to a certain op code in the EVM, it's going to say, this person is intending to do something that doesn't exist in my chain. I'm going to spit out some sort of result that is interpretable by the destination chain in order for that state to be applied. And so those kind of verified receipts can be passed around as transactions. Right. And those those receipts are, that information is carried from chain to chain through the coincident blocks you mentioned earlier, correct? correct? Awesome. We have a, as you kind of see here in the PR, 
we have some people working on kind of verified ways for those ETXs to be processed in manifests. And so those manifests are sort of aggregated snapshots of those transactions that are being created. And then those can be kind of passed and applied and preloaded so that the data is very optimized and the bandwidth is very optimized. But on the destination end, you kind of preload it all like when it's created and then you apply the right set whenever you're aware of what is correct. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I guess final question for you is, do you have any kind of big plans or switch ups for the future in mind for, you know, the, the protocol switch or ups. code? I'm sure, or... the, I'm sure the community loves hearing switch ups. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I think right now it's just being on track and, and getting the core thing done, mm -hmm. testing it, making sure that we're really putting out the best product possible and really trying to build the most impactful software. It's finding product market fit, but I still think there's a lot of industries and places that are kind of ripe for innovation. With Kwai, we want to target a lot. And of course, we don't want to boil the ocean, but we think there are a lot of kind of niche areas that Kwai can be really impactful. Other than that, just iterating quickly, getting good feedback and going from there. Awesome. Well, thank you again for taking the time to uh, talk to me today. And I'm sure our community greatly appreciates the insight as well. So uh, thank you and yeah. have a great one. Thanks, Max. See you soon.